Okay, everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Mark Norquist. I'm the founder of Modern Carnivore. Uh, joined tonight uh, by Matt Williams, who's uh, up in the corner and will be monitoring uh, questions that you might have. Uh, but our guest this evening is Johnny Carroll Singh. And um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about squirrels and squirrel hunting more specifically. And from a time frame standpoint, we'll, we don't have a set time, but I'm guessing anywhere probably between 40 minutes and an hour will go for length. So uh, grab yourself a, a, a beverage and sit back and relax and listen to the conversation. Uh, if you are going to head out hunting, maybe for the first time, uh, just make sure you do it safely. We're going to talk about a lot of things tonight, and safety is always of paramount importance whenever you're hunting. But if you're going to do this, make sure you are following the laws, and that includes in every state making sure you have your firearm safety certificate. Um, and I would also recommend, you know, finding a mentor locally, somebody within your community who can help you along the way to learn about hunting, and then maybe even tie into a local hunting group. This could be a rod and gun club that uh, there's a lot of those around the country. It could be a conservation group that is focused on different species or critter clubs as they're called. And there's a lot of them out there or some that are more advocacy based around specific issues like public land and, and other issues. So uh, uh, feel free to shoot us a note if you have any questions about that uh, at info at modcarn.com. And uh, just make sure you're safe out there if you head into the field and you're pretty new to this. So uh, as I mentioned, tonight I'm uh, joined by Johnny Carroll Sane. Uh, Johnny lives in the River Valley, Southern Ozarks of Western Arkansas. And he, as he says, it's the only place he's ever called home. He's an, a hunter, an angler, a naturalist, and a keen observer of culture. And I can attest to that because Johnny, I've had a few conversations about culture and, and I like his perspectives. And I think you are too on that. You know, professionally, he is a freelance writer, an editor, and a photographer. And he primarily focuses on nature, rural culture, uh, environmental issues, conservation, and agriculture. So... Mm -hmm. Welcome to the conversation, Johnny. It's great to great to have you here with me tonight. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. So I figured let's let's start by if you could share a little bit about um, a little bit about where you are. I I've never been to Arkansas, and so maybe tell tell us a little bit about uh, about Arkansas and the area you live. What's you talk about rural culture. You're in a rural area, I think. But yeah, like, I'm in, what's I'm what's topography area. like, and and what's what's the culture like there? Um, well, I'm uh, I'm in the River Valley, uh, and we've got mountains on both sides of us. To the north of the Ozarks, and that's where I spent most of my time. Most of most of my life, I've lived to the north of the river, the Arkansas River, and then the Washita Mountains are to the south. National Forest, uh, both of them, pretty pretty big. I think there's about a million acres in both of them. Um, the land is, um, well, I can tell you this, the culture is derivative of Appalachian culture, and that'll tell you a lot about the land. Um, it's not quite as dramatic as Appalachia, uh, you know, Smokies and, and North Carolina, Tennessee, places like that, but uh, it's similar. Uh, these mountains are, the Ozarks are really old. Uh, they're Man, I can't get the exact year. I forget, but but they're comparable to the Appalachians. Uh, okay. So they're wore down. They're they're not super huge. Uh, actually, the, the the tallest mountain in the state is right down the road from me. It's Mount Magazine. It's like twenty seven hundred feet. Okay. Uh, so not huge elevation, but enough to make it, and and it's rugged enough that it's made it, I guess, fairly inhospitable to um, a lot of people moving in and ag agriculture on a large scale. Uh, so it's, it's, there are eight places that are pretty remote still. Um, wonderfully diverse where I live right now. Uh, I can be hunting in the, or fishing in some uh, really, truly, you know, for the state mountainous terrain, clear, clear water creeks full of smallmouth bass that are spring fed, spring fed and cool. Uh, and then about the same distance from my house, I can be in the river bottoms. Uh, 
where there's their granule, which we call both in. And, uh, you know, bigger deer, ducks, we have a, we're not in the Mississippi Flyway this far west, but uh, we do get quite a few ducks coming down the Arkansas River and, and spend some time in the bottoms. So it's a really diverse area. Um, so, so with that diversity, did you, um, did you grow up um, hunting a lot of different things and, and was, were, were squirrels part of that? Uh, actually, no, I, I grew up, I grew up as an upland hunter. My dad was from sure enough, Ozarks. He lived a couple counties north Say of it again. He was from the sure enough Ozarks. He was, okay. he was from Newton County, which is, um, a lot of, most of it's national forest. Um, and it was wild and it was all upland. There wasn't any bottomlands there. And so, you know, I learned to hunt from him. And, and my, my maternal grandparents, they were from uh, the Missouri Ozarks. So my, my cultural ties are that upland stuff. And so it was deer, squirrels, uh, rabbits occasionally, uh, and a lot of fishing. I've, I've never duck hunted in my life, which is shocking. You haven't? Well, no, I, I'm not a wing shooter. I've never really been into, I, I hit a divergent point when I was 15. I'll tell you the story right quick. This this set the tone for my life. I look back on this. It really did. I had I started work when I was 14 years old because mom and dad said they weren't buying me any more bass lures and rods and reels. I was in a bass <laughs> club when I was 14. And and every penny I could get was going towards stuff to put in the tackle box or fresh line or whatever. Anyway, so I started working and and I started getting pulled in into more hunting. And and uh, I had one friend that had started getting into quail. We still had some Bob Whites around then. And then I had another friend that was getting into bow hunting and I saved up my money. I saved up $150 and I was either going to buy a Mossberg. I think it was a 12 gauge with a poly choke. I don't, I don't know much about it. Anyway, yeah. I was either going to buy that or I was going to buy a new bear bow. Bear had come out with a flare bow and had these muscle shaped limbs, you know, and, all this. and um, I don't remember how I reached the decision, but I bought the bow. Mm. <laughs> and so go. i was cast you know and yeah and that was it and I, I i the only time i pick up a shotgun now is uh occasionally and we'll get into this later if i'm really needing a mess of squirrels and for turkeys um so anyway don't duck hunt don't wing shoot went on my first quail hunt last year due to story about quail restoration in arkansas uh so yeah upland and mammals, <laughs> you know, and then, and then turkeys, nobody, when I was growing up really hunted turkeys, there weren't many turkeys. Uh, but as I got older, I got into that and turkeys are, are, are they're a springtime obsession. But, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, um, when I grew up in Minnesota, we didn't have turkeys at all. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays, a lot of younger people, when they, when they find out that I don't have a turkey hunting background, they just, they, they, they can't understand that. How could you not have that? There's, they're so great. They're everywhere. I'm like, well, they weren't around when I was, when I was no, kidding. No. And when spring came around, we were fishing. Yes, so, that's uh, right. I was, I was hitting the farm ponds early and then going to the lakes, you know, in the creeks. And, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, squirrels were a little bit part, part of that, that growing up. Um, and you still hunt squirrels. I do. Right? Yep. Yeah. Which you said to me a little bit ago, you never thought it'd be something that would be uh <laughs> marketable professionally. Skills. Yeah. <laughs> What's um, I never imagined. Yeah. When I was my, my 12 year old self could never imagine squirrel hunting being a marketable skill. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, squirrels are like um, probably typical of most, I'm going to say a lot of rural kids. Uh, I grew up, I got a BB gun when I was seven years old and was taught gun safety stringently um and um i guess i was allowed to take the bb gun out and of course i i, I had access to woods my grandparents lived next to, to a wood lot and then my other one set of grandparents did the other set lived right in the middle of the national forest up in newton county and so i could take the bb gun go roam and and my first encounters with squirrels were with that daisy red rider which just couldn't do it but but anyway, I learned a few things then too. And then when I got older, I think I was about 10 years old. Uh, I got a single shot 12 gauge and I was allowed to shoot the 22. Uh, I could take the, the 12 gauge out 
pretty much any time I wanted. Uh, I was not allowed to take the rifle because um, dad didn't think I understood, you know, how far a rifle, uh, a bullet would travel. Um, and so I took, I took the shotgun out and squirrels were my first pursuit. Um, I was pretty eat up with them even back then. I mean, that was a, that was a, when September back then, the season opened in September. And uh, now here in Arkansas, it's open pretty much year round. I think it closes for one month. But uh, wow. that was a that was a passage into fall was to go squirrel hunting. Uh, you started, you know, putting down the fishing poles and and picking up shells and looking for cuttings in the woods. And um, so I, I don't know how old I was when I killed my first one, but that was a that was an intro to hunting. Uh, as I got older, I took the twenty two out, and that, and, you know, a whole nother skill level to kill squirrels with the twenty two, especially early season. Actually, anytime late season when they can see you coming for a half a mile actually i think it's harder yeah. but um anyway yeah those were you know maybe back then and there weren't very any deer either and so we deer hunted but it was it was hard to kill a deer and i remember many many times that i would take uh, uh when i was a kid i hunted with a shotgun with buckshot and uh i would take number sixes with me and if the squirrels started coming around and, you know, the hell with the deer, we were just going to kill squirrels. <laughs> and that's what I did. Um, and that, that hasn't waned any, actually, as I've gotten older. Uh, you know, most people, I, I think, tend to outgrow that. And maybe I'm perpetually stuck in childhood. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but the squirrels are still really getting my juices flowing. So why do you think... Um... And I, I think it's sort of an obvious question, maybe, but you know, why why do you think most uh, adults don't think of of squirrel hunting? Either either if they're a lifelong experienced hunter, or if they're maybe new to hunting, because that's been my 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 experience. Is a lot of people don't think of it, and I think there's a lot of reasons. Well, for oh that, man, but... we, there's a whole lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> they're not very glamorous, right? And here'll be a shot over the bow, but man, a lot of outdoor television has gutted uh those stepping stones yeah. to becoming a skilled outdoorsman and saying you need to jump right into you know killing deer and get your kid out there when they're eight years old and prop them up with a not six or probably not not six but a 243 and kill a deer and kill turkey and all that stuff and 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 have skipped a lot of these steps i think that you need to do you need to learn or walk on before you get to these other stages uh it's not they're not very glamorous they're um i think a lot of hunters my age probably did start with squirrels uh and then had a kind of a sense of outgrowing them that they were kids quarry quarry and um you know not not worthy of, of the time because they didn't take a lot of skill to kill them um i think there's a lot i think all that's false um and i can demonstrate that uh, but I, I think those are probably the two main reasons um yeah. you know there's there and to be fair you know back when i was a kid again and, and the generation before there weren't many deer and there right. weren't any turkeys and if you wanted to hunt your options were squirrel rabbits quail you know that that was about it so small game right. was it you know right it was the game in town yeah mm -hmm. um so reasons why people maybe don't think about let's flip that around Okay. Why should people, whether they're experienced or brand new to hunting, go out squirrel hunting? What, in your mind, what, what's, what are, what's, what are the benefits to it? The maybe the hunt itself and everything that surrounds it. I, I think the experience, again, for me, again, it's a right of fall. Those first cool mornings, like we just had a cold front come through here, and it dropped down to which is cool for us in September. It got down. To like 55 or something you know um it's gonna be that in the morning and the wind's gonna lay down i'm gonna be in the woods tomorrow morning um you know it's still well it is fall technically today uh but there's still a, that transition you know late summer fall I, I dig all that i like being out there in it this is an excuse to be out there in it um so besides the aesthetics um i don't know I guess if, you know, if I go out with a, if I take the shotgun tomorrow, 20 gauge shotgun and some sixes, 
I can kill limited squirrels. I'm, I'm fairly confident I can kill limited squirrels in, in a few hours. If I take that shotgun with the scope and I've got a little Henry with a really cheap scope on it just to dial up the challenge, I might kill two or three if I'm lucky. Um, if I want to dial the challenge up even more, I can take this, this pellet gun I've got, the 22 caliber pellet gun, and try to close the distance to about 20, 25 yards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is nothing easy about slipping up on a squirrel, slipping up within 25 yards of the squirrel and getting a headshot. Yeah. Nothing yeah. at all. And um, so, and I've heard people say that, you know, squirrels are easy. And I, then I don't know how you're doing it. Maybe you're the master. I don't know. That's not been my experience after uh, 40 years, you know. Um, I can... I can add degrees of difficulty very easily, right. you know, and, and, uh, you know, now it's tough. Leaves are still on. We haven't had any leaf. It's, they're not even changed color yet. Very, you know, a yeah. few of them have, uh, some of the, the black gums and the, uh, sumac and stuff like that, but the oaks and all that hickories, they're still green. They're going to have leaves for another month. Um, so it's challenging to find, to get a good shot now but when leaves comes off, comes off, when the leaves fall, it's even more challenging. Like I said, you know, you got bare woods, squirrels that uh, I don't think they get a lot of pressure around here because not a lot of people hunt them, but but they they seen people and know what it means. Uh, they don't hang around. And, yeah. and in my experience, it, you know, you get one shot to screw up and that's it. They're gone. <laughs> um, I don't understand again, people that say otherwise or insinuate otherwise, I've got to assume they either haven't spent a lot of time mm -hmm. in the squirrel woods, or again, maybe they figured something out. I, I, I haven't, I, I doubt that though. <laughs> I think it's probably the former. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but so the reasons to go, you know, like I said, the, the aesthetics, uh, the challenge and they are really good eating. Um, yeah. Like I, I told you on the phone, we talked before number one, wild turkey uh there's nothing in the world like wild turkey breast and, and you can cook it however i prefer it fried bread and fried because i'm southern i think but um number two is squirrel and yeah you gotta gnaw off the bone sometime you know and all that. but if you get a tender gray squirrel oh my yeah. gosh and it doesn't take hardly any season you know salt black uh, black pepper a little bit of uh, garlic maybe just look at the, I always tell people, just look at the diet of that yeah, animal. Yeah, they, they eat nuts. I mean, they, nuts. And they, they smell like that to me. I mean, that's part of the aesthetics to me. I heard, I've con I made posts on Facebook about squirrel hunting, had people comment that they stink. Or they, they smell like the woods. I mean, they eat acorns and, and hickory nuts and cons and, you know, no. Um, I, see, I see a comment here, Matt, you're probably going to jump in. I, I did see it from Dan who said, uh, in my area, people refer to squirrels as tree rats. I've heard that same thing. <laughs> well, they are. I mean, um, I don't really see how that's a knock against them. Again, they're, <laughs> they're, they're rodents. Um, but yeah, their diet is pretty clean. Um, exactly. Well, and that's where he follows up with, you know, th th their impression is it, it's not good to eat. And I've, I've heard the same, my, my wife has, has said the same thing in the past, you know? Um, and, and so, I think it is, I think it's like so many things in the outdoors. There are, there are cultural uh, sort of perspectives that have been created over time that, uh, that, that for whatever reason take hold and, and people really don't have firsthand experience with it. Yeah. And if they, they actually tried the meat, they go, wow. You know? Yeah, I, I think so too. Uh, and I guess it depends, you know, I've never eaten one of, one of y'all's little red squirrels. I've heard that they can be kind of, could be a little, they could be a little bit piney yeah. yeah yeah piney that's a good way to say it. that's what i've heard yeah. you know ours you know we've got grays and foxes um and they eat, they eat our pine cone seeds here but i've not noticed it's different pines you know and I, and of course they they also eat other mast but i've not noticed any difference in flavor the only difference usually you can tell uh if a gray squirrel especially has been eating a lot of, of pine it seems like they're a little greasier yeah uh, when you clean them but yeah that's not an issue. So, so you touched on it there a, a little bit. You talk about grays, and then you just talked about the reds and foxes. So, you know, main main species in North America is with the most geographic spread. Um, you know, red or pine, uh, fox, 
and then Eastern gray having the biggest, the biggest spread. Do you, uh, do you focus, do you, you have Fox squirrel down there? I presume. Yeah, we have Fox squirrels. Yeah. Do you focus on one versus the other? Do you, um, have a preference? No, I take them as they come. Uh, actually the best eating is almost always a young squirrel, of course. And tops of that would be a young gray. Uh, old fox squirrels typically go in soup because they tend to be pretty chewy. Yeah. Um, but I'm not particular. Uh, you know, more bang for your buck with the fox squirrels, they tend to run larger. Uh, and again, if they're not old, they're, they're just as good as a gray squirrel. Nope. Yeah, sure. uh, it's usually whatever comes along or whatever I can get on. Um, you know, around here, in the deeper woods, you'll find grays predominantly. In more open areas is usually where you find fox squirrels. Uh, and I don't know what the ratio is, but there are a lot more grays than foxes um, where I hunt, which is tip and mostly in the national forest. I usually run into grays, uh, but no, yeah. I don't have a preference. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, let's jump into some some perspectives on on, on squirrel hunting. So maybe share with people again, somebody who's new here. They're like, they want to learn about, want to learn about squirrel hunting. Uh, what type of habitat do you find squirrels in? Uh, I look for early. I look for a good mix of pine and hardwood. Um, and that's easy to find here. Uh, they, they like the pine seeds and it seems like they key the, the two things that I've seen them key on the hard. Well, it's probably equal. Uh, Pine nuts are a little, or pine seeds are a little more uh, constant. There's not like a hot tree that I found there. Hickory nuts, hickory trees, you can find a hot tree and kill a limit. And like last year, I found a white oak that I had originally planted to deer hunt, but the squirrels were all over it. So I went out there one afternoon and limited on one tree. I never left. Um, so I'm looking for a mix. Um, and again, in, in my part of the country, pretty much any wood lot you go into you're probably going to find squirrels and and especially nowadays we we do have a, a dog hunting contingent take out uh curs and mountain vice and they hunt them with dogs and there's a few of those guys but you don't run into very many other people hunting squirrels so um you can find a you if you can find a wood lot that's got a mix of hardwoods and pines or even just hardwoods if you don't have pines in the area uh with oak you're, you're going to find squirrels generally speaking um you know what i do i'm very privileged so I don't, have, I don't have to look for sign a whole lot but but you know if i'm really checking a place out i'll go look for holes you know you want to look for for uh hickory nut holes or acorn holes or places where they've shredded a pine cone and stuff like that active feeding sites um right now you can't find nests very easily because there's so much leaf cover uh, but that usually I look for feeding sign, uh, to be honest with you, what I do now when I squirrel hunt is I go to a place and again, very privileged in a lot of places I've been to a lot of my life. So I know probably there's going to be squirrels there, but I get there before daylight, get out of the truck, ease down. Usually there's a path or if it's, uh, get into the woods a little ways and a lot like turkey hunting, you sit there and wait on the sun to come up and start listening. And uh, typically you start hearing little scurrying feet and you hear them jumping from branch to branch. Um, and then you hear feeding sign, hear, hear holes, you know, coming down through the leaves, laying on the forest floor. Uh, that's, that's how I do it. And then you put on, that's when the hunt starts. You put on the stalk. Uh, if you can find a little booger and, you know, get in range, get his head in, in the scope. And it still may not happen, <laughs> but, but that's, that's what I do. Do you, um, so when you're going to squirrel hunt, um, maybe talk a little bit about the patterns, maybe both seasonal as well as daily patterns. So you're talking about getting out in the woods, uh, before sunup, uh, is that, do you always, do you always start your hunting day for squirrels uh, before sunup or will you go out midday or do you go out evenings? Um, I do occasionally go out in evenings and early season it's it's always closer to the edges of daylight. Uh, squirrels, from what I have seen, um, react negatively to cold temperatures. 
So like, you know, as the season goes on and it starts getting colder, and when it starts getting really cold, and again, it's relative, cold, really cold here is in the 20s. Uh, you know, early early morning activity is probably going to cut down a little bit. They're, they're going to be more active as it starts getting warmer. Um, so, you know, in the winter, focus later in the morning, earlier in the afternoon. Uh, as to patterns seasonally, um, for feeding, you know, again, hickories, pines, and white oaks are, are preferred from what I've seen. And so early season, I'm keying on those. Typically, I'm going to say by, by winter, most of the hickories are gone. The white oaks with squirrels haven't got the deer and turkeys and bears have. Um, usually what you got left over is red oaks, red oak acorns. Uh, they tend to have a little more tannic acid and usually last through the year a little better. Uh, so I start looking at those. Um, and then actually in the spring, if you do that stuff, occasionally I will squirrel hunt in the spring. You look for mulberries. Uh, mulberries are a big draw in the spring. Um, but, you know, a lot of the feeding patterns, patterns fall through winter mimic, as far as mass mimic deer, mm -hmm. uh, white oaks and then red oaks. Uh, so you do have you said you said your season in Arkansas. Did you say it's it's basically eleven months? Yeah, it, they cut it off. They cut it off in March, and I think it's mostly to keep people out of the woods when turkeys start gobbling with guns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they cut it off in March, and it opens back up. It's in May. I think it's a couple weeks after turkey season closes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you can hunt, and occasionally in May, you know, we'll still have some cool mornings where it's getting down the fifties. And I've done that. It, it has a different vibe. I don't know. You know, squirrels to me always mean fall. And so it yeah. feels a little weird. But sometimes, you know, if the water's high and still too cold to wade um, to fish and there's nothing else going on, it's a good, cool morning. And, and I've got a free morning and I'll, I'll go in, in the in the spring. Um, but yeah, it's it's open. Yeah, 11 months pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So I think our, our pattern it varies by state for everybody who's probably if you're if you're wondering, you know, like here in Minnesota, we're around a six month. It's like September through February, I believe, is is our, our pattern. Um, and great for grays and foxes. Uh, actually, red squirrels here, we have them, but I don't believe they're considered actually game game animals. So um, you just shoot them whenever. <laughs> you just shoot them whenever. Yeah, exactly. You okay. can also one thing I also found out recently is you actually don't need a license to shoot squirrels on your own private property, which was interesting. I thought, okay, I guess that may, I guess that makes sense. So some some flexibility with that. But um, well, let's talk about let's talk a little bit more about about how to hunt them specifically. You know. I think from a basic standpoint, for those people who are on here who are who are new to hunting and going to use squirrel, uh, a squirrel hunt as as a place to start, you know, I, I always say, as I mentioned at the outset of this of this webinar, you know, make sure you're safe. Know know where you're going. Know make sure you know how to handle a gun. Um, make sure you're you're gonna meet legal requirements. And that not only includes making sure you've got proper firearm certification and you've got a license. But you also understand what clothing requirements might be, as well as um, bag limits um, and things like that. Uh, you know, so like here in Minnesota, we actually do have a blaze orange requirement. You have to have one article of, of clothing above your waist that is blaze orange. So it could be a hat, could be a vest or a jacket. Did, in, in Arkansas, do you, do you have any blaze orange requirements? The only thing we have blaze orange for is modern gun and black powder. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So again, that's something to, to, to look into. And that's where reaching out to your, your local fish and game agency could be called DNR, could be fish and game, could be any number of different, uh, different names, but just Google, Google it up and, and what the regulations are. And you should be able to, should, you should be able to find that. And then just make sure you got the right gear and be comfortable. And, and again, ideally a, a mentor with you to, to help out. But um, so if with that as sort of a backdrop, I was thinking about sort of like, okay, maybe the process, you could start the process of research in a lot of different points, but let's, let's look at scouting. Um, do you ever go out and scout squirrels? My guess is you live in such a rich area of squirrels. Yeah. You, you just need to go find those, those trees you're targeting, right? That's the thing. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, when I'm, 
usually through September, late August, if we get some cool days, I'll check out some places I plan to hang a tree stand for deer season. And along the way, I'm keeping my eyes open for squirrel sign, you know, uh, again, looking for hot trees. Um, I, I do, that's probably the extent of my scouting is, and even when I'm going squirrel hunting, uh, you know, if I get to a place and there's not any activity right off the bat, I'm just going to walk further into the woods and listen and look uh, for that feeding sign, you know, the discarded holes mostly. Um, I, I've got to say though that, you know, it's the same as turkeys. Almost every squirrel I've killed, I've heard before I've killed it. Um, and I don't know how many squirrels I've killed, but that's just the nature of the beast in forest hunting. You know, when you're in the woods, you're, that's what you do. And, and so most of the time I try to move very slowly and very silently. And I remember as a kid, uh, my uncle took me squirrel hunting a lot. And that was his, he, he always said, I sounded like a herd of elephants coming through the woods. And I was in a hurry to get to this place and hurry to that place. And, you know, he drilled into my head. I need to slow down and, and take my time and pick my path. And, and now I do that pretty instinctively. Um, you know, I, I choose my, I choose a way through the woods where I'm not slapping underbrush where I'm, uh, careful about stepping on twigs, uh, that could snap, um, and take a few steps, pause next to a tree for sometimes five, 10 minutes, uh, and listen. And if nothing's going on, then you walk, walk a little further. Um, you know, that's, I know that sounds very simplistic and very basic, but that's actually really a big part of the appeal. Um, you know, I get pretty nerdy about deer. I, I don't do that. I guess I'm nerdy about squirrels, but, but it doesn't require a huge commitment in equipment or um, I don't want to say expertise because it does, but, but you don't have to, it's, it's more forgiving. You got yeah. more, you got more opportunities, I guess. That's the best way to say it. Uh, you got way more opportunities with squirrels. So I generally think about, you know, similar to a, lo a lot of hunting, you could either still hunt, which I always think is such a funny misnomer of, of mm -hmm. you're actually moving while you're still hunting, or you could more take more of a stationary, go sit and wait. Uh, it sounds like from what you said, you're more of a, you, you like to still hunt, slowly walk through, creeping through the woods yeah. and then stopping every, maybe for yeah, five, 10 it, minutes. It depends. I'm, I'm really flexible in that. I've spent hour or more at a certain tree. And I said, last year I found one hot white oak and I was there for two or three hours and killed lemon squirrels and didn't move. Uh, it just depends on what's going on. You know, um, if you, yeah usually i usually hunt with a 22 um and so the reports you know fairly light you don't scare everything in the woods um you know many times if i kill a squirrel or i'll let it hit the ground and just sit and wait uh for 20 30 minutes sometimes and see what else happens nearby or listen for something going on further off lots of times you'll shoot a squirrel and you'll start another one barking you know 100 yards 200 yards away and so you can put a, a stock on that squirrel uh, but it's, it's really, I don't have a, again, unless I know there's a hot tree I'm going to, uh, I'm really flexible. Let's just see, you know, what happens and, and we'll make a game plan on the fly. Uh, yeah. Do you, um, in your experience, has, has the indication you found, uh, you know, or I guess what's, what's sort of drawn your, drawn your eye up and, and looking for that squirrel, has it been sound? Has it been branch movement uh what 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 do you what's what's the, the most common trigger for you to to key in on a squirrel um most of the time it's um i mean it's sound but it can be i don't know depends i mean <laughs> early in the morning usually it's branch movement um you know later on when squirrels get to where they're going to feed um they it's uh it could be again feeding sounds uh, them cutting on nuts. Um, let's see. So talk, talk a little, talk a little bit about cu cutting nuts. Cause a lot of people maybe don't know what you're, what, oh. what you're saying. Oh, how do you describe that? <laughs> I mean, you got these, this rodent with these incisors, um, that are, um, you know, willing, usually like on a hickory nut, it's most pronounced. They have to get to this big thick hole to get to the, to the nut. And then they have to crack the nut to get to the meat. 
it's a very distinct <laughs> sound. And to me, it takes me back to being again, 10 or 12 years old whenever I hear it. Um, but it's a, just a gnawing, a very rapid gnawing. And then typically you'll hear holes falling down on the ground. Yeah, yep. that's it. That's it. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, on, on acorns, it's a little more of a cracking sound. Uh, you can, you can hear them cracking through the holes. Um, not much sound with the, uh, pine nuts. Um, but those are, especially the hickory nuts are really distinct and you can, you can hear them on a quiet morning a lot further away than you think you would. Um, those are, those, the, the, the branches, you know, uh, squirrels run through the branches, leaves rustling. Sometimes you hear them climbing up bark, um, barking squirrels. Uh, sometimes, lots of times they're on high alert. So it's really tough to, to close the distance. And on the same time, sometimes they see you, you know, they see you, they know you see them. <laughs> And they still stand there and just bark or sit there and bark and their tails are going and you know right where they are and you almost feel bad sometimes for that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's a good way. And lots of times if I hear them barking a ways off, I'll give them time to calm down, you know, before I ease over there. Because uh, it could be a hawk that flew over. It could be a bobcat that, that walked through. It could be all kinds of things. And, and squirrels typically, from what I have experienced, 15, 20 minutes is usually their attention span. Uh, some of them go a little longer, I think, if they've been messed with. But usually if you can hang hang tight for 15 or 20 minutes, they'll forget and go back to doing something else or give themselves away uh, in some other way. So you're talking about barking, which is can, can, be, can be an alert that they're communicating with other squirrels because squirrels are pretty social. They they're are. territorial, they're social. And so they're talking with each other in the trees, on the ground. Um, and even communicating with, like you're talking about cutting nuts. I always love the aspect of, I think most people don't realize one of the one of the most common sounds, especially at this time of year, a squirrel makes is that cutting sound. Mm -hmm. And it's not their actual vocalization. It's those, it's those yeah. teeth Jeez. just going, going on the nuts. Um, that, and you can hear them, you know, they chase each other. Um, I think the squirrel rut is in winter. I think it's winter and then maybe mid summer. There's two, of them. There's two yeah, of them. Yeah, two of them. And I forget exactly. I think it's pretty mid winter here, maybe January, February. And, and but even other times of year, squirrels chase each other. You can hear them making little soft, kind of growling, chirping, chuckling noises when they chase each other. Um, you can also tell the difference uh, between a fox squirrel and a gray squirrel by the bark. Uh, they have really distinct vocalizations. Um, yeah. Uh, Again, sound is most almost always. Occasionally, I'll see one jump, you know, or catch a movement, but especially early season, it's almost always sound. I find myself relying upon uh, uh, upon sounds, e even in deer hunting, when oh, yeah. squirrels are always what you're hearing rather yeah. than a deer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. You think it's a deer, even you after. I think it's a deer. Now, I'll tell you this as I've gotten older, I've gotten better you know cadence and yeah. deer have a certain weight to their step that just sometimes i have to second guess it you know i'll i'll, I'll as a squirrel as a squirrel oh no it was a deer you know <laughs> um but they they do have a little different again cadence weight to their step uh but yeah lots of times most of what you're going to hear when you're deer hunting is squirrel uh, yeah i always think it's the irony of like the squirrel is so much louder than the deer for the oh, most yeah. part yeah. And, and and also, like you say, the cadence, I, I've sort of over the years realized that, too, if you have that sort of that that staggered cadence of the squirrel versus yeah. the deer is more of the deliberate yeah. squirrel and quiet. Yeah. And then if they can find a stump or a log to get on, they'll. that's weird. I've watched them. They don't like to go in the leaves if they have an option not to. They'll they'll get on a log or a stump yeah. or a tree or hop to tree to tree so they don't have to get in the leaves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so do you, um, back to the, to the vocalizations for a moment and, and the sounds, I guess, do you use calls ever? Do you use squirrel calls? I have one little call I carry in my pocket and I don't, I mean, squirrel cars, squirrel calls aren't like turkey calls or deer calls or duck calls. They're not, you're not going to bring squirrels in, uh, what, or what I use them for. Again, maybe there's a really skilled squirrel caller out there that can do it, but I, I haven't figured that out. 
what I do is if the if I can't see the squirrel, if I know he's there or she's there, if I know the squirrel's in the tree and, and relatively close and I can't see it, it's either in super stealth mode or behind something. And sometimes I'll get the squirrel call out and lightly, you know, make a sound, tap it against my leg or something like that, just to get them to show themselves. Um, that's really the only time I've used it. Um, yeah. I haven't, I can't really think of another application where it would work. You know what I've what I've done is, uh, and I I agree. I think I think the the main calls that are either going to be bark or even the the maybe even you know they're the young distressed. Oh yeah, the uh, call. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, is is more of a locator. But what I have had squirrels come in on is so I've got I've got six black walnuts in my yard. Oh wow! And and so right now there is a pile about probably five feet wide of, of black walnuts that, that this red squirrel has one red squirrel in the, in the one area has piled up. And uh, so I've got so many black walnuts. I've done different, different things. I've, I've dried them out and then used them as to, to imitate the, the, the cutting sound of the squirrel. Huh. Huh. And I had, I've had squirrels come basically running at me. And then get about two feet from me and hit the brakes. They're like, "Whoa, that's not another squirrel." Okay, well, that's something I had not ever heard of. Huh. <laughs> so try it out. Try it that's out. Man. Yeah, we've got some black walnut trees around. I'll have to try that. Yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah. I mean, I most people I I know do not do not, and, and most you know really good squirrel hunters don't don't use calls. And so it's one of those things where I've always been intrigued by it. I sort of feel like some some aspects of it, you know, the the call makers, it's it's like, well, we make duck calls or whatever else. What else can we make? And and just to create some more products. <laughs> I would agree with that. And you know, I've actually I can do it with my voice. I can do enough of a squirrel call my, or not my voice, but I can do a thing with my hand. I've got a nephew that can actually do it with his voice. He sounds like a gray squirrel. Uh, but you know it's kind of gimmicky. Uh, and again, yeah. the hint, the times I've used it are rare. I mean, it just most of the time I just seem wait. You know, if you can wait a little bit longer, the squirrel's going to show. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe there's some value there. Maybe you could go ultra sporty and say you didn't want to kill one unless you called it up. I don't <laughs> you know. I, I don't know how that would work. But, yeah, maybe the, the black ethics. walnuts. That may be the thing. You know? <laughs> The somebody, need to, somebody get a hold of primos and have them make a black walnut squirrel call. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So I got a question actually. Um, so wait, you're describing these calls. Um, are these like calls, like a duck call where you blow into it or like a turkey call where you're, you know, have something, you know, scraping along something else or like Mark where he's got the walnuts together. Um, <laughs> how are you, how are you making the sound? Um, the one I've got is actually, I think a Primo's call. And it's a bellows call. It's got a little rubber bellow on it and one way valve and you can shake it and it chatters and you can tap it and it chirps. And, um, I think it's got a thing on there too, where you can close one of the holes and, and push the bellows and it makes that distress call. Uh, they also make the distress call. It's that circle, that metal circle. They call it Mr. Squirrel. And I haven't seen it in years, but it was, I wanted them when I was a kid and dad's like, mm, get one, you know, so I never did get one. And, but it's supposed to make that high pitch. You're supposed, actually, I think the, the instructions on the, on the box or on the package were to make the call and then you shake a brush, a bush real violently, like it was a hawk trying to get a squirrel or something like that. And so anyway, they're, mm -hmm. they're air powered. I don't know of any, mm -hmm. except for the black walnuts. I don't know of a percussive. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and then and then um so somebody when um mark you'd made the cutting call kind of for a second um the audio kind of cut out what what can you do that again or can <laughs> that you... was excellent by the way i i missed it and it looks uh, like somebody else missed it too if you could uh or, uh, or at least describe what the cut yeah is. yeah like, i was gonna look and see if i had any of those sitting around it's it's more of a like a it okay is is basically the sound and so if you take if you take a couple of these black walnuts and you do that sort of that pace it's i i think it's usually sort of a again think of think of this think of this squirrel chewing on the nuts and just sort of an irregular cadence to it okay 
Okay. Now listen for it next time. That's what's sort of fun. I I think. Once you start learning about it. Now, next time you hear something, you're like, I think that's a squirrel. Look and see. Is it a vocalization or is it is it actually them cutting? And mm. uh, and so I think it's 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 sort of sort of fun to figure that out. That wasn't a very good impression that I just I thought it was. Say. I thought it was right. <laughs> it got the point across, I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Johnny, what, uh, let's talk about uh, a little bit about other equipment. So not, not big on the calls, like, like most people, um, some people do use them, but, um, how about, how about clothing? Do you have anything specific that you, that you wear? I, I do wear camouflage, but I, I grew up hunting in jeans and flannel shirts. And, um, I, I, I think squirrels, again, if, if you move slowly, um, and don't make a lot of noise you can get away with a lot no matter what you're wearing um you know boots in early season i usually i do wear snake boots sometimes in the early season uh we, we have timber rattlers and uh cotton copperheads and uh i'm not super worried about them but lots of times i'm not looking exactly where i'm putting my feet when i'm walking through early season and, and i have almost stepped on a couple of rattlesnakes uh, so uh, you know, uh, shirt, jacket, according to weather. Uh, one actually pretty important piece of equipment that I started using, that's been several years, I guess. I started wearing my turkey vest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perfect. I mean, you got a pad set on if you want to set. You got a little pocket in the back to put squirrels. Uh, I got room for a bottle of water. I got room for shells, you know. Uh, I, ha I have heard of people using pot calls for squirrels. So there you go. Next time, if it's, if, okay, if it's yeah, left in your turkey I vest, done you that. try it. I uh, have not heard that, <laughs> but okay. But yeah, the, the turkey vest has been kind of a thing that's in my truck when I'm going squirrel hunting. Um, that's probably it. I can't think of anything anything else that I take. Again, that's really the charm. Uh, yeah. Don't need a lot. Uh, you don't have to make a lot of plans you know you don't have to gather equipment up the night before um, you know like me deer hunting going to deer going deer hunting is a is a process for me yeah. i get up and take a shower i mean you know i hear my coffee and all that stuff and then before i go i take a shower <coughs> and i put on clothes especially sit out you know so don't have any scent on them change clothes in the woods you know change back at the truck super careful about all my scent on that stuff you know squirrels i don't care you know i get up put on my clothes drink coffee and i go so let's talk about that for a moment actually real quick because you touch on something there and i think what we've been talking about here so you know from the senses of the of, of this animal the bushy tail um you know sight very good mm -hmm. um hearing very good S sense of smell very good however as i understand it you know, it's mostly in terms of locating nuts and i've never heard anybody say the squirrel smelled me like like a deer or or an elk i've never in you know experience on deer stands having squirrels walk all over where i've been climb up the tree i climbed up and of course i'm very scent conscious deer hunting but still you know i've had them almost land in my lap deer hunting and and even gun hunting when i was a kid you have them come right up on you um i don't think that's a big thing the, the most the, the thing i'm most concerned about is them seeing me coming and hearing me um and again even if they see me, I think if I'm moving slow, I get away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but the key is to slow down. If you think you're going slow for new hunters, and this is good advice across the board, no matter what you're at. If you think you're going slow, slow down at least to the half the speed you're going. <laughs> and you're probably still going too fast. Uh, slow down. Uh, take your time. Listen. Be patient. Um that, those are the big things. Go slow and keep your ears open. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know. The, 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 to me, it's the sound and 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 movement. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, was it Fred Bear who said the best camouflage is not moving or something yes. something to that effect? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So slow movement. Don't worry about don't worry about smell. Again, don't have to take the shower so you can get up get up a uh, twenty minutes later, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you really want to? Here's the thing, and I, I haven't done it, but you know this probably. If you, deer hunt out of tree stands you're going to get swarmed with squirrels in the morning and they are for for an animal that is predominantly i think preyed on by raptors they are amazingly oblivious to threats overhead i'm i am 
completely astounded at the stuff I can get away with with squirrels right under me. And I'm like, dude, I mean, you know, there's red tail hawks all over this place, you know, and, <laughs> and they just, they don't seem to care. Uh, right. I don't know with a 22, probably with an air rifle. There's a lot of mornings I can kill a limited squirrel in a tree stand. It may, again, it makes me wonder why I don't employ that for squirrels. I guess because I kind of like walking and you know all that stuff. But, yeah. but that would be a very effective technique. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so most people will either hunt, and I think we've touched on this a little bit, but now I'm forgetting if this was before we recorded or when we've talked before <laughs> versus now uh, when we've been live, but um, 22 caliber rifle, mm -hmm. uh, small bore shotgun or any shotgun really, um, are the are the primary uh, primary firearms used for squirrel hunting? Do you ever? Let me ask you this: Do you have you ever uh, have you ever done archery? Gone after I have. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I have I've, of course, I've shot a few from the tree stand on slow yeah. morning, and then I have, you know, gone specifically out after squirrels. Uh, oh, it's it's fun. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, you know, I don't, I didn't shoot flu flus. So it was all ground shots yeah. uh, or, you know, on the side of a tree that I could reach. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's not something I do now, but it mm -hmm. was something I did when I was younger, actually quite a bit. Yeah. But if you're going to go out and does a very early season versus late season, but if you're going to go out intentionally going after squirrels, what's, what is your preferred firearm that, you, that you'll take? Uh, I'll prefer to take a, a scope 22 rifle. Okay. If I had my old eyes when I was 25 years old, I'd take open sights. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really would like to do that. Um, but like I said, what I, I'm looking at them right now. They're on the wall across from me. I've got two 22s. Uh, and the one I prefer to take is the little Henry. And it's got a $17 Tasco scope on it. Uh, you know, Henry's <laughs> why'd, you, why'd you ruin that little Henry I'm gonna with the Tesco? I'm going to tell you. It was purely for aesthetics and my own vanity. Um, it's a lever action rifle. And it, it killed me to put a scope on. I don't want to put a scope on it. But I can't I can't see well enough, you know. And so I, I actually, uh, I'm going to name drop here. I, I think it was Hal Herring. I may be wrong, but we were talking about a scope to put on it. And he, I think he mentioned it. I may be wrong there. Maybe it's someone else. But it's the Tasco is very small. And it, it really sucks in low light. Yeah. Um, it's probably a step down from open sights in low light. But it gives me <laughs> just enough magnification in good light that I can, you know, kill squirrels with. So the, it, it's a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. When the weather's bad, I've got a savage, a little a nylon savage. I take it, drives tax and got a nicer scope on it. You know, it's cloudy yeah. or rainy, which, by the way, a drizzly day, a drizzly cool day, primo. <clears throat> those are the days you need to be going if it if it quits raining uh and breaks off clear sorry i need to drink here that's it breaks off clear or even stays drizzly and, and no wind that's time to go to but anyway yeah. when it's bad weather i take the little nylon or the little black uh savage like an old nylon 66 used to take when i was a kid um occasionally very occasionally if it's been slim pickings with the 22, I w and I know there's squirrels that haven't killed them, I will take a 20 gauge shotgun and get a limit of squirrels, but I, I don't do that very often. Uh, That's when you're I'm, going for meat. I am. I'm going, you know, I'm really craving squirrel. Uh, or maybe we've had a few get togethers uh, with my, my daughters and, and their significant others and grandkids, and we need a bunch of squirrels for everybody. And so I'll go kill some. Uh, but but you know, yeah, that's that's going out to kill me. I would prefer to take that little Henry twenty two. Yeah, it's a great gun. It is. It's it's just again the challenge is right. You know, it's enough of a challenge to 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 really push me. I think, uh, but it, I can still kill squirrels with it. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, if I kill two or three squirrels in the morning, I'm good. I don't yeah. I don't need to I don't need to bring home a whole stack of them. You know. I'll bring two or three home, clean them, put them in the freezer, and we'll I'll kill some more in a few more mornings, you know. That's how I look so, at it. So uh last subject then after the hunt. Um 
when you clean your squirrels, you leave, you leave after you skin them, do you leave them whole? Do you part them out? It depends. Um, if we're going to fry them or roast them, we've done some in the, in the oven. Uh, I will quarter them. <clears throat> and also squirrels have back strap. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a little bitty piece, but it is really good and worth the effort. Um, quarter them. I, I usually can't get much meat off the ribs. I got a friend that I, I think he picks the ribs. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, I, it is. And I, but I, you know, front quarter, hind quarter, back strap. Um, if we're going to make soup, uh, which typically in the winter, I like to have a, two or three squirrels that we will make soup. We, I leave them whole and, you know, boil them, get the meat off of them, and then make a vegetable soup. Um, fried is preferred. Mm. Roast, roast okay. is pretty good too. Fried yeah. is preferred. Uh, right now is prime time because we still got okra. Mm -hmm. um, so you, fried okra, fried squirrel, and homemade biscuits. I mean, I mean, we don't get much okra up. No, here. no. I mean, that meal's got a drawl on it. I mean, you can you can hear that meal talking. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that's that's really good. Um, that's probably my favorite. Yeah. So it depends on what we're gonna do with them. Um, and again, they're delicious. If you haven't tried them, you're missing out. Uh, well, and I think, and that's that's the thing, you know. It, that we always talk about we always have a conversation uh about about the food aspect of it because uh we figure that uh, everybody's got to eat at some point might as well eat something good and i think based on what you're saying and, and what we're talking about it's it's hard to beat squirrels so you say for you number two after turkey breast i'm gonna huh? say yeah number two turkey's pretty i mean there's a pretty big gap turkey's Turkey's ambrosia of the gods. I mean, <laughs> you know, like we we share squirrel and deer meat, but my wife will not let me share a turkey breast. We don't, yeah. you know. <laughs> if you get invited to our house to eat wild turkey, that's probably the highest honor we could bestow upon you. Uh, <laughs> that, it just doesn't happen. Uh, so yeah, I'd say it's it's number two. Um, and and another thing, I want to go off a little bit. And I know I've spoken pretty flippantly about killing animals. Um, that's a very, um, it's a good word here. I take that serious though. I mean, I know, you know, we're, we're taking a life and, and that's another thing that the squirrels taught me. I, I think Henry David Thoreau made, made like, one of my favorite quotes, you know, the squirrel you kill in jest died in earnest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think about that. Um, you know, I, I know my dad was, I remember one time he caught me, I didn't want to skin the squirrels. I'd killed some and I didn't want to fool the skin them. And so I tried to hide them and I was going to throw them out. And he found out, I don't know how he found out, but he did. He went and got squirrels. And um, I got in really big trouble over that. And he didn't, he didn't articulate, I don't think, you know, quite the emotions that I'm, that I'm feeling about it, but that's where it was coming from. And, and a lot of that, uh, because I think it comes from the roots of hunting, you know, which is a, uh, that's, that's our food and and because it's nourishment it's it's really it's really sacred mm -hmm. i mean it's, it's not something that you joke around about and when you kill it he I, I remember lessons with the gun you know he told me you you point at something pull the trigger you're deciding whether that thing exists or not and that was really powerful for me and he he parlayed that really nicely into again well, i say nicely again he didn't articulate it quite as well but but i know that that's what he meant you know he grew up really poor and squirrels, I think were a, a fairly important source of, of food, you know, for them for a time. I, I'll tell you this. I know at one time he told me that when the squirrels went around one time, my grandpa went out and filled a, a tater sack full of robins when they were flying through migrating. Cause that's what they needed to eat. Yeah. So, you know, killing an animal um, was, was really a, a, a pretty serious thing. And squirrels have always, again, I know I've been kind of uh, light about it, but uh, I remember those lessons when I was younger and I still feel that way when I kill squirrels today. I mean, they're not, it's not just a, it's not just a, a target practice. Yeah. Uh, it's not just something to shoot at and go out in the woods and have fun. You know, you're, you're taking lives. You're taking them for probably the most noble of reasons or for absolutely the most noble of reasons, uh, but you're taking a life. Uh, 
anyway, I know I kind of got off there and got a little somber, but I thought I think that's important. I think a lot of people lose track of that in, in hunting as a whole. Uh, I, I I appreciate you sharing that. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and uh, and I think that's something that that I I we we in the hunting community need to remind ourselves and remind each other of. And most importantly, I think tell tell new people that and, and make sure they understand it because a lot of people um, who aren't hunters who didn't grow up with it don't necessarily understand that. And I think anybody who would call themselves a hunter uh, has those ethics and, and adheres to and adheres to that that philosophy. So I, I'm glad you shared it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's serious, but hunting is a serious thing. We can have fun with it, and it, and and, it, and we can. We can really enjoy it, but it is, but it is a serious thing. Taking it life, of a it's it, it's who we are. I mean, man, we can go down a whole lot of the road here, but that's who we are as humans. I mean, we were hunters, and so it's it's mm -hmm. okay to embrace that. But at the same time, because we're human, we can wrestle with all these other uh, moral and ethical things in our minds, you know. And and uh, I think it's important that we do that. Yeah, I do too. Absolutely. Well, hey, Matt, uh, any other questions that anybody had yeah. put in? Yeah, actually, um, back to kind of the, the food portion, um, people wondering, um, so you, you go out in the woods, you put in some effort for a squirrel, right? What's the, um, you know, what's the yield? Why, like, how much do you get, how much meat do you get off of a squirrel? Not a lot. Um, you know, I don't know that I've actually ever... You know, I haven't weighed one like I ever have a deer or anything like that. I'm going to say, though, now, I do think I'm a world-class squirrel eater. <laughs> I can I can probably eat half a dozen squirrels. So, I mean, it depends on probably more. When you get in one, <laughs> one sitting or is this like? Yeah, in one sitting. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, but I'm a big eater. I mean, I'm a guy that not that long ago put away a whole large pizza and it's not a big deal. Sure. And I love right. squirrel. And when they're hot and off the grease, you know, and everybody's eating and there's still half a platter full of squirrels over there after, you know, then I'm probably going to go ahead and I may not finish them off, but I'll get close. So mm -hmm. I guess it depends, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here. Um, God, I hate to use chicken um but, uh, so they don't taste everybody like, gets it i know but they don't taste like chicken um but like probably a hind quarter might be comparable to the little legs you get in hot wings and stuff hmm. that's probably sure. a pretty good approximation hot the the front quarters are a little smaller so probably a good analogy to a wing probably a little more meat than chicken the most little chicken wings so that's that's probably a good way to describe it i would think um Again, you know, I don't, it, it, go ahead. To re, just real quick to, to that point, it's interesting somebody asked that question because, uh, and I'm guessing maybe it's along along these lines. Uh, I've heard more than a few young people uh, have, have shared with me in, in recent years that they haven't been a hunter, but if they choose to hunt, they, they want to try to get the greatest volume of meat per death of an animal. And so sense. therefore they're going for a large animal, which I, I get that. I think it's, I think it might be a little misguided in terms of, in terms of the idea behind it, but I understand it. And so well, I don't know. Have like you ever the, heard it? I, I, I don't know that I've heard that, but I can relate because, you know, our bow season opens this Saturday and I, I probably won't get serious about it for a couple of weeks, but when it starts getting really cool, I'm really focused on deer until our gun season comes in, which is about mid November. I bow hunt almost exclusively, and when gun season starts, it gets kind of nuts. Um, but I'm serious about that because we need at least four deer to get us through the year. You know, and that's what we, I don't want to buy any meat unless I choose to. Um, so in that regard, I understand it. But also, there are some, va there's some value beyond just quantity of meat. Uh, again, all the things I've talked about, all the reasons I've talked about squirrel hunting, the, you know, the chance to polish hunting skills, to learn hunting skills, uh, the, the beauty of, of early autumn in the woods, you know, Liz, just hearing the squirrels come alive in the morning with the cutting on nuts and all that stuff. You know, it's really similar to me for turkeys as turkeys. You know, I, you can't live on turkey meat. You, you couldn't, you could, I guess, but it would take a lot of turkeys, you know, to survive on turkey <laughs> meat through the year like I do for deer. 
you can't legally kill enough to do that. But the turkeys are, um, whew. was it Aldo Leopold that said, uh, uh, you got the North Woods, you have a maple, <sighs> something in a roughed grouse. And he, oh, yeah, he, it, that is Aldo Leopold. I can't think yeah, of it. Yeah, I can't think of it. And he called though, yeah. the, he called the rough and grouse um, man some term. I can't remember what it was. But he said, if you take the rough and grouse out of that equation, the whole picture is different. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. That's that squirrels for me in the fall, uh, early fall. That's turkeys in the spring. Um, you know, the squirrels are the hardwoods in late September. The turkeys mm -hmm. are the are the hills and hardwoods in April and May. Whitetail are you know mid October. Um, so there's there's more to it. I get that though, and I actually respect someone that would say, "I want to kill as little as possible to get as much as possible." I I can respect that a lot, but again, I think hmm, whew, we're all consumers. You know, um, everything's going to die. Nothing gets off this planet alive. Uh, <laughs> we just happen to most likely be eaten by fung fungi and bacteria and worms and not by predators but almost all these other animals that we're hunting that's that's the cycle and whether it's by a red tail hawk or great horned owl or a gray fox or a bobcat or a, or a johnny with a 22 you know it's, it's it's the same and again i can't think of a more noble actually this sounds weird but a no, more noble death uh, yeah i mean i think it's yeah, I mean, I think I think it, I, th I think that's I think that's 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 true, and I think also for for the person, I I guess I always look at it as, um, I think that that intimacy of being part of 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 the yeah. the paying paying the price of the time the effort, not just the wallet, uh, for that meal. I think is an invaluable lesson. That is, that is exactly right. And that's one that I did think about time, but you're exactly right. The, the, the sweat, the, the effort. Um, yeah. And it, it's a connection to place. Um, it's the same reason I fish. I, I rarely keep fish. I can't remember the last time I kept fish to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I wrestle with the ethics of catch and release fishing. But at the same time, <laughs> that the fishing connects me to the creek um, in ways that I can't, I can't find another way to do it that, that in, with that level of intimacy. And it's the same thing with this, the squirrels, you know, hunting the squirrels and the turkeys and stuff. It's, it's a connection that I can't, I can't duplicate any other way. Uh, yeah. If I wouldn't raise this way, if I hadn't grown up, you know, in this culture, it, it might be different, but it's ingrained in me now. Um, so, no, oh, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I think we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do another one of these, and we'll just talk philosophical aspects of hunting. And, yeah, and, and, yeah. Now that will go all kinds yeah. of like, yeah. <laughs> well, hey, Johnny, I I can't thank you enough for for joining us here tonight. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who are gonna you know head out in the squirrel woods for the first time this fall. Again, please be safe, but have fun too. Uh, enjoy it uh, and uh, let us know how it goes. And uh, we'll do we'll do a few more of these. So stay tuned for for different uh, different subjects on squirrel hunting and and more. And so uh, we'll sign up for night. Johnny, thank you. Matt, thank you for uh, for tending to everything behind the scenes there. I appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll uh, we'll do it again. And Johnny. We didn't even talk about this earlier. Oh my gosh, the philosophical hillbilly. <laughs> so where, where can people go to learn more about what you've written and what you do? Um, I do have a website called the philosophical hillbilly. And on the site, you'll have, you'll find a short bio. Uh, I'm not super great at keeping it up to date, but I try to put my, um, I put links to, to recently published stories that I've written for, for publications uh on one page and i've got a page that has uh, a lot of my older work on it uh, i've got some other podcasts uh and radio shows i've done on there too um i've also got a little self-published book of old essays uh, that i've written over the last 10 years 
that um, there, there are no how to's in there. Uh, it's all really introspective, kind of what we were doing here the last part of the show, a whole lot of that. Uh, so if you're into that, if you, if you dig all the Leopold and Paul Shepard and Edward Abbey and um, some of those guys, not that I'm anywhere close to that level, but it's, it's the same kind of stuff. Now, I think people, uh, people around here probably uh, buy into a lot of that and, and like, uh, like reading that. So I'm sure they love reading your stuff. So the philosophical hillbilly, Johnny Carroll saying thanks so much for, for being here tonight. We'll talk again soon, my friend. Thank you.